thank you so much, and thank and 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 Jane, thank you for that introduction. Pick a stool, either stool. <laughs> um, we're going to tag team this, uh, and and uh, but I just want to say um, I'm really glad to be here to see some old friends. I hope to make some new friends. I, this is, I think, my fourth KM World. I'm not sure, um, but but it does feel a little bit like like coming home, but also a little bit like coming home with. Uh, you know, when you're, when you, if any of you had the experience that I've had of when your first older sibling comes home from college and he's learned these things, and some of them are dumb, dumb jokes, but some of them are really interesting, and stuff that, that, that you sort of didn't know was out there. And I sort of feel I'm coming back to you uh, and to this community after an intellectual adventure with Patricia, having learned some stuff that I think is really, really, really cool. Um, this is what we're going to talk about this morning. Uh, as I said, I'm going to take the beginning and the end, and Patricia will take the high points in the middle. Uh, but we're going to pick up, uh, we're, we're going to be looking at uh, wooing, wowing, and winning, and the role of service design in creating successful companies. And we're going to link that very closely to the opportunity that it presents to you as KM practitioners, because I would say that the management discipline and idea of service design, of which you probably have not heard, is one of the single biggest opportunities confronting companies or presenting itself to companies, and an enormous opportunity for KM. What is service design? It is the application of design principles to services, to business and, and to the services that surround manufacturing. It is the idea of of creating a customer experience in accordance with your strategy so that you deliver that customer experience every time the way you want it to do it. We believe that great customer experience needs to be built into a company, laid into its very keel. You can't, the world's greatest driver could not get perfor great performance out of a Yugo, right? You know, it has to, or, and, 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 and if, it, if performance weren't designed into a BMW, you couldn't get it out of a BMW. And customer experience is the same way. And knowledge management, which needs to be part of the work and in the flow of the work, is the same way. And if you put the two together, it's pretty critical. Now, we're going to be focusing on services for a number of reasons. One, it's 80% of the economy, but 80% of what we know about knowledge and about, and about management has to do with manufacturing. Two, if you take a look at the knowledge economy, the knowledge economy is very strongly about services. And three, it really is a new frontier. Um, what do we mean by the idea of, of, of services being designed? I mean, when we think about design, we think about a phone. But, but let me just do, you know, do a little quick survey here. How many of you prefer Starbucks to Dunkin' Donuts? And how many prefer Dunkin' to Starbucks? And how many don't care? Yeah. What's, really interesting, what's really interesting is that the majority of you were Starbucks, the, the vast majority of you had an opinion. They're basically selling the same thing. They're selling better than belly coffee, right? They're selling the same thing, but you have strong opinions. And in fact, there are research studies done by an ad agency in which you, sort of deprivation studies, in which you force Dunkin' people to go to Starbucks or Starbucks people to go to Dunkin', and they get very weird. It's sort of like having too much steroids. You know, they get a little like, their life gets a little insane. But why is that? Let's think about this. What color is the Starbucks logo? No peeking. <laughs> what color is the logo? What color is the Duncan logo? What color is the, what is the lighting like in Starbucks? Low. What's the lighting like in Duncan? Bright. What are the chairs like in Starbucks? Comfort. What are the chairs like in Duncan? Has anybody seen a chair in Duncan, right? <laughs> what is the tagline of Duncan? No peeking. What's the verb? Everything about Duncan is grab and go. Right? It's all designed that way. Even the fact that you can get donut holes in a cup holder, thi in, a, in, a, in a thing that fits in the cup holder of your car. Everything about Starbucks is sit and stay. It's all designed, as Howard Schultz said, to have that Italian cafe thing, right? This was purposeful. This was designed. In fact, when Starbucks went astray, it's because they strayed from this. This was designed into the experience. There are 400,000 different varieties that you can get at Starbucks. Your design is supposed to be personal, and you, uh, you know that because everybody gets to the front of the line and think, whoa, which one do I want, right? Um, 
but, but I mean, they are, they, the point is that they have been designed to create different, unique experiences, and that's the point about service design. Now, when you think about services, services are different. I said, you know, it, most of what we know about, manage, about management comes from, from manufacturing, but services are different. Services, first of all, usually happen in the presence of the customer. You know, the customer's right there in the hospital saying, no, operate on this leg, not that leg, right? The customer is right there with you. So you have to be able to handle variety and customization. We like to say that services products are handoffs and services are handshakes. But it's not just one handshake, it's a bloody receiving line of handshakes because services take place in what is often called by service designers a journey with multiple touch points, multiple interactions as the customer goes through her or his relationship with your customer. So every department and every, and every partner, every ecosystem partner affects your customer's experience. You have to take that into account. Services, it's hard to know for a customer to know in advance what he or she is getting. You know, it's hard to know anything about a doctor beyond the fact that he's got li he's licensed. And you know, somebody's cozy B on B on Yelp might be somebody else's rather, that's Bates Motel, the checkout experience, if you get to it, is a unique experience, right? So you have to take that into account. You have to set clear expectations and meet those expectations every time. And the other thing is that customers do not own a, sp an ex a service. They own the experience of it. If I sell you a car, it's your car. You can own it, you can resell it, but there is no market for used experiences. You keep the experience, the customer keeps the memory. And so when you think about this, the customer takes away memory and emotion is critically part. Those four differences make services very different from manufacturing and make the design of services and the provision of knowledge for the design of services different. Your ultimate goal in most services is what we call an ah moment. That is the moment when the customer says, ah. the idea came to us, the idea was brought to us by some people at Hyatt who were tracking the check-in process for people coming into hotels. Terrible flight, long day of meetings, whatever it is, they roll the bag in, they go to check out, they get their room, they go, they get their key, they find the elevator, they go upstairs to the room, the key opens the door, they open the door, it closes behind them, they throw their bag on the bed and they go, <sighs> But when you think about the, some of the taglines and slogans of great service customers, think about that implicit ah moment. Think about you're in good hands with Allstate. Think about membership has its privileges. Think about the happiest place on earth. All of these are ah moments. And to talk about how we get there and how you create them and how you win, how you wow, Patricia, my co-author co and collaborator in crime. Uh, that's the great thing about having a co-author of the opposite sex because people can tell us apart. <laughs> so, how you woo. So wooing, that's not how you do it. Right. <laughs> how you woo, first you have to think about what is the experience you want your customer or your client to have. Anyone who is experienced in the art of wooing knows that you really have to set the stage. You really have to figure out what it is you're going to do and how you're going to do it. And one of the ways you do that is by thinking about the promise you make. And we developed what we call service design archetypes. And that really is a way to help you determine who you are. What is the promise you are making to your customers? Take a look up there and see, think maybe where you fit in. Just take a minute to see who you are. You know, are you the classic? Are you simply the best at who you are? Are you cool like Warby Parker, for example, or Apple? So we like to call the service design stars the Wizards of Oz, because they're the ones who are really great at creating those ah moments that Tom was talking about. And if you think of, and now everyone is surprised that we put the post office up there. Okay, fair point. But one of the things about the post office is they have really worked hard to change the customer experience. You can now 
first of all, not even go to the post office. How's that for creating a great experience? You can, <laughs> buy, you can buy stamps online. They have solutions now where you can buy boxes so you know exactly how much you're going to be spending to ship something. Disney, everyone, you know, Disney is the safe choice. You know what you're going to get at Disney, and it's going to be fine for everyone. And you'll notice that these are not industry specific. And that's why we really encourage you to think about who you fit into in terms of an archetype. You know, a really interesting example of how to use an archetype to think about who you are is an airline company that we wrote about in the book, Surfair. It's a subscription model company. Who do you suppose their inspiration was in terms of an archetype for their subscription, fly all you want every month for one price model? Any ideas who they might have looked to? Sorry? Netflix? Yes, you read the book. You, you win the KM award. Here we've got this special trophy right here. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> And can I just say, you were the first person to ever get that right. So double congrats. You take both empty glasses as a prize. But it just goes to show that an archetype is not about an industry. It's about what you're going to do and how you're going to do it. Your goal in creating awe moments is really to deliver customer delight. And that is a function of two things. It's what the customer literally experiences, what happens to them in the moments that they are with you. It's, it's that handshake that, that Tom was talking about that we're both participating in. But it's also a function of what we call technical excellence, what happens backstage that nobody sees but everything that's going on to make the magic happen. And you really need to figure out how to get both of those things right and a great way to figure out if you're doing that is to take, to do your service design report card and get an overall GPA. So you'll see that these are listed into both customer experience and technical excellence. And those really sharp among you, like that gentleman over there with, with Mr. Netflix, will notice that they're, they all begin with E. Those are the 10 essential elements, also E's, of customer experience. And a really great thing to do is to either do this with your team, you can do it across the company. If you really trust the client or customer, ask them to do it for you. And also, you do it with your competitors, what you know of them. And it's a great way to benchmark yourself because if you are doing, if you have a 4.0 in customer experience that everything is great, the customers walk out happy, but your staff is tearing its hair out night after night to make the customer happy, that is not sustainable. And this is a way to tell, first of all, how are you doing and where are the breakdowns and where do you need to improve? We have actually found that this has become the single most actionable thing that companies immediately go, okay, now at least we have a starting off point. So really, urge you, um, if, you know, later, you can do it now even while I'm speaking, I probably won't even notice, but you can go to the URL there and take the quiz, and it really is eye-opening. Some people have their eyes open and then they shut them going, oh my God, I wish that didn't happen. But it really is a way to start off for you to figure out how are we doing and where can we do better in delivering customer delight and those ah moments. So when we were thinking about service design and how to apply it and make it actionable, and Tom and I both have a lot of experience covering companies, working with companies, interviewing top management companies over the years, it really occurred to us that there were five things that service design stars not only do, but that they know. And we were able to distill those into five principles of service design and delivery that I'm going to take you through. And what's also important to remember about these principles is they go across industry. It's B2B, it's B2C. It's as simple as if you are providing a one-on-one -on -one service like cutting hair or uh, 
you know, in a restaurant to the most complex intellectual and knowledge management services. So before we go into the principles, I want to ask another question. Who thinks the customer is always right? Well, the customer is always right, provided you have the right customer for you. And that's a really key thing you have to remember. Even though we started off saying you have to think about the experience that you want your customer to have, you also have to think about who is that customer. So this is a slightly more sophisticated example than Starbucks versus Dunkin'. But it really goes to the same idea that two companies providing a similar service but a very different type of experience in providing that service. Charles Schwab is for the person who wants a platform, a do-it-yourself investment experience. Edward Jones, on the other hand, is about hand-holding advice, really doing a lot of the work for you. They're both going after customers, interestingly, with about the same amount of money to invest. But it's about which customer is right for them. I should not be calling the person at Charles Schwab all the time with all my great investment ideas Perfect. and asking what they think of them. You know something, they're eventually going to figure out a way to siphon me off to somebody else because they cannot do a good job for me. So I am not the right customer for them. So this is really one of my favorite principles because it is counterintuitive, but once you think about it, it makes a lot of sense. So. I'm not going to trick you with the next question, but here's another counterintuitive principle. Don't surprise and delight your customers, just delight them. First of all, why should it be a surprise if you do a good job and you delight your customers, okay? If that's a surprise, there is some disconnect, and I really urge you to look at that at your service design GPA. But the goal is really that customers know what they're getting from you. They know the promise you're making to them, and you are fulfilling that promise. And delight isn't always the magical experience <coughs> that you get at Disney. Delight can be as simple as getting the great cup of coffee that you want, either fast and on the go at Dunkin', or getting it and being able to sit and stay like Starbucks. Delight is delivered on your terms. And part of how you delight people is you meet expectations every time. I don't know about you, but I've had that experience. I've been seduced by the great picture of the really yummy hamburger. The only thing missing, I think, is bacon. Um, <laughs> note to self, Tom, find a picture right. of a bacon burger. And then look at that sad burger on the plate. Who has ever had that kind of experience or something similar? OK. I think you know what I'm talking about. So really, you delight people by meeting their expectations every time. It's as simple as that. It's hot. And now we're getting into the principles that aren't counterintuitive, but these also, when you think about it, make an awful lot of sense. So service design must not require heroic efforts by you or your customer. Well, what does that mean? We break that down into three elements. The first we call the Downton Abbey syndrome. There's chaos in the kitchen, and Mrs. Padmore is going nuts, and Daisy's whining on about something, and everyone is running around like a chicken without a head, but upstairs, his lordship and his guests are having a sumptuous meal with nobody the wiser that everything is amiss in the kitchen. It makes for great TV. It's not a great way to run a business. So you have to figure out how to avoid the Downton Abbey syndrome. The second is lean service design, which means it's taking out the friction for both you and the customer. It's doing all the right things, but only the right things. Again, however you define what those right things are for you. A hotel like JW Marriott is going to offer a different set of right things than Motel 6. But what are the right things for you to offer? Design those in, in a lean, efficient way. And the last one is about being easy to do business with. 
Try being your own customer for a day. Go on your website. Do whatever it is that your customers would have to do to try to engage with you and figure out how hard it is. Is it calling your 800 number? Is it trying to fill out forms? Whatever it is, figure out how hard it is for your customers to work with you and start eliminating that. A company we wrote about in the book, um, Mobile Mini, does portable storage units. Those big things you see at construction sites, probably the least sexy business um, in the world, but one we learned a lot from. And they realized a few years ago when a new CEO took over that they were not easy to do business with in two really essential ways. First of all, they were leaving product on site until they needed it, not when you were done with it but until they needed it. And that was really irritating the customers. The second thing was they, and this was something that they had done proactively because they thought it would be better for the customers, was to centralize service. Well, a new CEO came in and found out that the company was not easy to do business with because people didn't like the product being left there, but they also didn't like the centralized service location. It was much better, they found, to have people be able to call the local mobile mini location and be able to talk to somebody there. And it was also usually the only point of contact somebody, the client actually had with mobile mini with a live person. And they realized that they had really taken something essential away. So the new CEO, at no small expense, decided to undo that centralized service system. And they have since found that they actually have a score about how easy you are to do business with. has gone up dramatically. So has share price, so has earnings, and so has market share. And that really goes to fixing your customer pain points. What are the ones that make your customers go crazy? And one of the other ways you find that out is really by talking to the frontline employees, whoever they are. We tend to think of frontline employees often as low-level people paid by the hour. That's not necessarily the case. It's who is listening to the customer, who has the relationship with the client, who hears the stories. But then you also have to do something with that knowledge. Knowledge management, if you will. And the fourth principle is about delivering a coherent experience across all channels and touch points. Your customers don't think of you as being one channel, and neither should you. They engage with you in lots of different places. You need to be able to engage with them in all those ways and do it equally well. And this gets tricky because there are a lot of other people who affect your customer's experience. Think about going to the airport, TSA. You may be flying first class and have a great experience once you get on the plane, but guess what? Delta has no control over TSA. So you have to think about who else is part of the customer experience, who you can influence in that way, who you have to make up for, and just be conscious of the fact that there is this whole ecosystem. And though it may seem like I'm never done, well, you're never <laughs> done either. Just like we said, knowledge management and design is different in services, so is innovation. Apple may have taught us that innovation in products is a constant thing, but it really has to be in services as well. And that goes back to the idea that, again, the customer is in the experience. So you have the opportunity, in a sense, to innovate rapidly and all the time because you're getting constant feedback from your customers and your clients. It needs to happen all across that journey that Tom was talking about. And it needs to happen not just across the journey, but across all the channels. And you need to do it in a way that makes sense for you. Rapid innovation works for some types of companies and some types of experiences, not for others. And a company that we think actually is a great example of innovation and services is Intuit in every sense. They have innovated <laughs> in terms of branching out into new markets. They've innovated with new products. 
during tax season, they're probably running a few hundred different tests on the software every week. Little tweaks here and there that are not obvious to us, but to give them constant feedback. So they really have mastered the, the notion that you are never done and you have to think about innovation in a very granular sense as well as in a big picture sense. So to sum up how you wow, you do it by delivering the experience you want customers to have, but doing it reliably, repeatably, scalably, and profitably. Those are the four legs of the chair of service design. And if you remove one of those, repeatability, you do not have a stool, you have a wobbly chair that is going to fall down and will not support anyone, including your business. And now I'm going to turn it over to Tom, who will talk about how knowledge management is that nice piece of upholstery on the chair. <laughs> oh, I wouldn't think it's that. I think it's the, I think it's the, I think it's the, the seat itself. You know, so, well, so, all so, right, it is. So, 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 all right, I'm going to have one, one more history question. First of all, one of the, these, I, I imagine that as you were listening to this, a little crawl is going through your head, like how does this apply to service design? How does this apply to KM? How, and, and, and I'm going to try to draw some of that. Hello, how are you? How to try to draw some of that uh, ex explicitly here, but I want to begin with another quiz. June 27th, 1967, a major event 50 years ago in the banking world. What was it? You know, you know. It was the first ATM introduced at a Barclays Bank in Enfield in the UK. And why is that important? That is important because it's when people really start thinking about the user interface. Before that, the bank's user interface was a smiling person behind a cage. And the customer, him or her, the customer himself never actually touched the bank's systems. Now, there were user interfaces before. There was the automated horn and hard art. There was some self-pumping gas and so on and so forth. But this was the moment when the customer would actually get in there and suddenly people had to think, what does the customer need? What does the customer want? What are the customer's questions? What does the customer need to know in order to be able to do what the customer needs to do? And this begins to bring up the knowledge management question. A lot of what we think about about knowledge management and a lot of its history actually is based on a, on a, on a sort of a production model. Now, many of the first experiences of KM actually started out in professional services firms. Some of you may be old enough to remember back when AOL was cool, Booz Allen and Hamilton created something that they called KOL, which was knowledge online. But even in these professional services firms, there was a kind of a production mindset. When I came to Booz and Company, we had to rebuild a knowledge management platform from scratch, state-of-the-art, SharePoint, platfo SharePoint platform, blah, 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 blah. But it was all about getting quals and stuff and, and, and teams together in response to RFPs. It was about finding the million-dollar slides. It was, about, it, was about, it was about assembling this, assembling that, and assembling the other thing. It had a sort of a production mindset. And what I want to suggest to you is that we are at a new you know, kind of opportunity in knowledge management. I'm on the advisory council, the business advisory council of the Columbia Information and Knowledge Strategy um, program. And there's some grand old subjects like taxonomy, where, for which there are boot camps and so on and so forth. But there are very interesting questions about findability and innovation that also show up in this. And we're beginning to get, this is beginning to get to the idea of how do you engage the customer in your knowledge program. Now, if you go back when Leif Edvinson and Hubert Saint-Ange and I and a few other people were sort of developing the ideas around intellectual capital. This was the metaphor, right? The metaphor was that there were tangible assets that people could see, that accountants could see of cash, land, and building, plant, and equipment, and underneath the seven-eighths of the thing, seven-eighths of the company's value, were your human capital and your structural capital and your customer capital, your relationship capital. But, and the intangible assets were the bulk of a company's assets. And this has done this has had a tremendous contribution, I think, to business. I mean, to, to accounting, to thinking about strategy, to thinking about how we organize. This model has been tremendously valuable. But though you see the word customer and the word customer capital, first of all, this is a balance sheet view of a company. 
It's not an income statement view of a company or a cash flow statement of a company. And second of all, the word customer capital is in there, but the customer is not really in there. And all of this is sort of implicitly as hidden from the customer as it is hidden from the CFO. But if you actually think all of these assets, we're talking something more like a side wheeler than something else because all of these assets actually touch the customer in a service organization. At some point, the patient in the hospital is dealing with the knowledge of the doctor, is dealing with the process, is, is dealing with his or her relationships across, an, across a whole bunch of people in the customer. And, and so these assets circulate Service design people like to talk about, as Patricia mentioned earlier, things that are on stage and things that are off stage. But intellectual assets, knowledge assets, go both ways. I mean, they both go in and out. That's the last time I'm ever going to do anything like this, but I just couldn't resist it. I just sort of <laughs> kind of had to do it. And if I was even better, I would actually be, have to be able to make the human capital structure, capital and customer capital, go around in the same kind of wheel. But I, I just really had to think about it. So think, but you, if you think about if you think about the ATM, if you think about Agile, you actually realize, if you think about almost all services, you actually realize that these things are mixed up all the time, off stage and on, and KM has this opportunity to coordinate it and be right in the middle. Service designers like to create journey maps. The customer journeys with us through a series of things. It, you could call it the marketing funnel, but it's, it's from awareness down to calling up the 800 number, getting somebody in Bangalore who can't solve your problem. But there are, these there are these touch points, right? And the customer makes a journey across these things, things that you see, that the customer does, that the frontline employee does, that backstage employees do, and that support processes are involved with. What's missing from here, and should be here, is what knowledge is involved at each of these stages and on whose part because it's not just my knowledge as a provider, but it's what does my customer need to know before she gets to the front of the line at Starbucks and decides which of those 400,000 things she wants while I'm you know, looking at my watch behind her. What, where are decisions made and what provisions need to be made internally and externally so that those decisions are made the way we want so that the customer has a great journey? Think about this. Um, you know, the automobile assembly plant was the most complex manufacturing environment. Uh, a big city hospital, tertiary hospital, is the most complex service environment, a place where they do everything from laundry to brain surgery in the same room. And think about, or in the same building, think about the journey of, of a patient or a customer. This is a map from a great hospital in northern Wisconsin called ThetaCare, which is a great exponent of applying Toyota production system stuff to, uh, uh, to hospitals. And this is a map of a patient, uh, a cancer patient. Uh, and you have a happy ending or an unhappy ending depending on how things go. And this map was particularly designed by them to point out that most of the people engaged in talking to the customer or talking to the patient actually don't work for the hospital. Uh, they might be the YMCA, they might be the chaplain, they might be the surgeon who may have hospital privileges but not work there. There are the rehab people, there are all kinds of people who don't work. So how do we coordinate that ecosystem? But you can also think about how do we pass not just the electronic medical record, but the knowledge and the experience so that the patient's journey, and remind, remember, she's under stress and so is her whole family, so things are not sticking in her head, right? How do we manage our knowledge and the patient's knowledge across that journey? These are the kinds of opportunities that you can think of when you think about ways in which knowledge management can strengthen the customer experience. Now, quick pause here. If you ask people what's the most important thing their customers want, the first thing they say is quality, second thing they say is customer experience, third thing they say is price. Customer experience is right up there with quality and it's rising. So that's, the, that's a critical differentiator. And there are a number of things that you can do. You can identify customers' knowledge needs at key touch points. How do they, what decisions do they have to make? What do they need to know to make those decisions? Similarly, what are the key knowledge needs that we've got at each of those customer touch points? That's a lot of the work you're doing now, but I put to you that thinking about those customer touch points as a way of organizing will help make KM stronger. Linking KM and CRM. What do we know and what do we know about our customers and how do those two things come together? You know, they really should be one system, albeit separate, frustratingly, software stacks. 
How do you forge continuous learning loops among customers? We were talking to somebody who works with uh, the call center, one of the call centers for Fidelity. And one of the things that's fascinating is they work with those call center things, not just to see how many calls can you answer you know, in, in a certain amount of time, but what are the questions that are being asked? And they try to infer from that what the customer's stumbling blocks are, as well as what their own process stumbling blocks are. So how do you create those feedback loops? How do you share knowledge horizontally, vertically, with partner companies and with customers? And how do you develop knowledge-based ways to make customers more valuable. To that end, I commend to you a piece that my pal Michael Schrag wrote in Harvard Business Review a couple of years ago about a number of ways of making customers more valuable. But it's not just like selling more stuff to them, it's having them innovate with you, it's having them engage with you uh, in, in, in all kinds of ways so that they actually become co-creators and partners uh, in, 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 as, as you move your business along. I'm going to skip over that slide because I sort of did that. Um, let me try to bring this home with a few critical ideas. We've talked about, first of all, the importance of designing, of, of finding your path to ah, right? What is the ah that we're trying to create and what is our yellow brick road that will get us, that will get our customers to the ahs that we want them to get? Uh, we talked about the principles that you want to design along that, use along that journey and I've tried to bring you an idea and a vision of how knowledge management can really be much, can really help to strengthen that and bring you, by the way, back out of the library, as it were, and much more into the face of customer experience, which is where the value is being created. Now, I want to talk about three critical potential opportunities. One is analyzing, uh, analyzing the customer journey in terms of ahs and ows in terms of the ah moments and the pain points. What are those ah moments? What are those pain points? You guys have an extraordinary set of tools that can help you identify them. You can work with the design thinking guys and the use case guys and all of those other people who are trying to figure this out to, to try to figure out not only what they are, but what their root causes are and what, go, what lies behind them so that you can accentuate, you can make your ahs into awesomes, uh, awesome ahs, and you, can, and, you can, uh, and you can take care of the ahs and start eliminating them one at a time. And by the way, some of those ahs are big, but an accumulation of small ahs will kill you just as much. If it's just, you know, uh, the third time, when you get off the metro in DCA and you walk uh, a, 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 and you're going to a gate, you go off the metro, Guess what's not right in front of you? A sign that tells you which gate. You have to look and walk about 100 yards over this way or that way for that sign, right? That ow bothered me once, and it really pisses me off now. <laughs> because it haven't, they haven't changed it in the last five, right? Because I keep seeing it, and it's like you scratch at it, customer. So what are your ahs and what are your ows? However, there are moments that are really critical. Neuroscientists scientists will tell you that the peak experience, what happens at that top moment, you see Machu Picchu, you look over the rim of the Grand Canyon, the peak experience, the peak emotional intensity, it can be good or bad, really sticks in your head. The peak experience is important and the last experience is important. Peak and last. So how do you make your peaks really amazing? And if they're problematic peaks, how do you deal with them? I'll talk about one of those, uh, an example of one of those in just a second. And how do you make sure that your last experience is, by the way, not something you've fobbed off to that infamous call center in Bangladesh that is just being managed for costs and actually giving you a bad last, you know, you, you only get one chance. You don't want to have just one chance to make a last impression because then you'll get another, you'll never get another chance to make a first impression. So peak and last, how do you figure out what those things are? And then what are your make or break moments? Because there are touch points and moments that matter more than others to your strategy. Some of these things are hygiene factors. Everybody's got to do them. It's my license to do business. And those may vary by geography or industry. You know, in Manhattan, every dry cleaner has to deliver. In Los Angeles, every dry cleaner has to have parking, right? Some, then there are the market segment essentials. As Patricia was saying, the Marriott, the JW Marriott does not compete with, the, with, with Motel 6. You know, they both provide a bed for the night, but, but you know, JW Marriott does not have to match Motel 6 with interstate locations and 
bad coffee and donuts, and vice versa, Motel 6 does not have to have 800 thread count sheets, right? And, 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 and so, so you're their market, and then there are the critical moments when, the, the moments when a lot is at stake. And just think, for example, of an auto insurance company, and think about, I gotta call them up, and I've gotta say, I've got a new car, or my daughter's got a car, or my son's got, I wanna put a new car on the policy. That's table stakes, or it's market segment essentials. But let's think I'm calling up from the side of the road, and there's steam coming out, and there's somebody with a, saying, I got whiplash, whiplash, and, and maybe there's somebody really seriously hurt, and I get and say, please listen carefully, because our, because our, because our prompts have changed, right? I mean, that, what do you do at those critical moments when things is on the line? And these, I put to you that these three ideas are areas where you guys can make a huge difference. There are three fundamental questions a service designer has to answer or ask, and you can be part of the asking and part of the answer. What is the experience we want our customer to have? And there may be experiences, there may be use cases, things like this, but what's the experience we want our customer to have? What does the customer see at each stage of his or her journey, and what must happen backstage so that we deliver that magic every time? Services are, are experiences, experiences are journeys, and journeys are designed. And with that, thank you.